Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Today is the fourth Sunday of the Blessed Month of Tut, and as, as we remember from last week, Kabuna mentioned that the, there's a link between the two Gospels today. Last week we were speaking about Zacchaeus. We hear our Lord saying, Today salvation has come to this house, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save. And then we see the repentant woman today, where our Lord says, Your faith has saved you, go in peace. And our Lord proclaims salvation to both because they both repented wholeheartedly from the depths of their, of their soul. They repented. Let's examine today's gospel. The gospel comes from Luke chapter 7, verses 36 to 50. It should be a familiar gospel passage that we, we should know. We should know this gospel passage. <clears throat> we know very little about this woman. All we know is that she, because of her damaged reputation, she was very easily recognized by the people and, in fact, despised by the people. What we do know is that she did not want to continue the, to live the way that she had been living. She was already on the road to repentance before she even entered the house of Simon. She knew that Christ would be there and bought specifically for this occasion a jar of ointment, a jar of oil, possibly to anoint the head of the guest. <clears throat> but her desire to change brought her to the house. Her desire to change brought her to the house. But once she entered, she couldn't dare to approach him directly. But in humility, she stood, she stood at his feet. She anointed the feet with, with, this, with this precious oil and her tears. And she wiped them with her hair. And so we see this picture of someone who is in need of healing of her complete, her complete self, her soul and her body. And in contrast, we see Simon the Pharisee. And we assume, at, at least outwardly, that he was a great guy. He showed hospitality by inviting Christ and other guests to eat at his house. <clears throat> he displays a certain amount of open-mindedness by inviting Christ not only to dine with him, but maybe to even to discuss the law. <clears throat> Additionally, Simon was probably curious about this, this person who might be a prophet. Yet his hospitality was not complete. He did not greet him with a kiss. He did not offer him water to wash his feet. He doubted that Christ was even a prophet since he allowed a woman to touch him whom everyone knew that was a great sinner. Simon did not look beyond the surface of the event that he saw unfolding before him. There was no self-reflection. There was no humility. There was no compassion. And he remained outside of himself, and he condemned not only the woman who came to the house, but our Lord Jesus Christ as well, because he could not recognize her for being the sinner that she was. This has happened in verse 39. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, he would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him. She's a sinner. Everybody knows it. What kind of prophet is this? So we get a glimpse into Simon, his heart, and his true motive for inviting Christ to his home when he says to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know. He would know who this is who's touching him. The sinful woman is convinced that Christ is the Messiah. And the Pharisee, Simon, was cynical. He was cynical even about Christ being a prophet, not alone the, the, the Messiah. So his intention was not to honor Christ, but to humiliate him. And this brings me to what I want to talk about today. As it is written in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, For the Lord does not see a man as see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. At these times, we hear our Lord's words very clear. Judge not, lest you be judged. 
the, the regulations, if you will, in Scripture against judging, they're meant to save us. It saves us from self-righteousness, from spiritual blindness that can see all sins except our own. Why do we do it? Why do we judge? It's easy to allow ourselves the role of accuser and judge and jury and to condemn our brethren for offenses. When we ourselves commit the same offenses, maybe even bigger ones. I I know I do. So let's be honest. Most of the time when we find ourselves judging, we condemn them for insignificant things. Not fasting the way they should. Did you see the cheese on the pizza? Did you see it? Not fasting the way that we think they should fast. For indulging in the same behaviors that we ourselves oftentimes exhibit. And when we judge them, we do it because it makes us feel good. Oh, thank God. Oh God, I thank you that I am not as other men. Most of the time we judge others, we are dressed in the long robes of the Pharisees. When you come to church, you are not to look all over the place and see who is wearing what and what hairstyles. and No, you are to look at the icons. This is why the church dresses herself in icons. You are to look at the icons for inspiration and hope that God can refashion you and transform you into one of his saints. Then you are to undertake the most difficult task in life, refraining to look around in church, and instead look to yourself. Look within yourself. It's crucial that we should not be dragged down by those who would emphasize the outer appearances. And then we transform this church from a place of prayer, from a house of prayer to a place of judgment. The church cannot be reduced to this. Christ desires so much more for us. And once we go down that road, the church loses its distinctive gift as a place of healing. A place where we can freely enter into the warm embrace of our Father This is why the repentant woman went to the house. She saw this gift. She saw this warm embrace, and she knew that it was a safe place to go to. Even though it was the house of Simon the Pharisee who was judging, she knew who really was there. Here's a flip side of it. Sometimes, other times, there's essential times when judgment is necessary. And in fact, it would be sinful not to judge. St. Paul mentioned these times, as did our Lord. Even the law in Leviticus said that there were times when, when love often required rebuke or reprimand. We read, you shall not hate your brother in your heart. You may surely reprove or reprimand your neighbor and not incur sin because of him. This is especially the task of clergy who are set as watchmen. It says in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, Obey those who are to rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. We are responsible as clergy. If we love our brethren and we see them walking headfirst into wickedness and disaster, we have to reprimand We have to. If we don't, then they shall die in their iniquity and some of the guilt will be ours. I hear it all the time. Don't judge. Under the most circumstances, I hear this as a defense of someone's behavior. We cling to God's warning against judgment, not for salvation's sake, but to to please our own self-interests. We think that if we are not judged by those around us, then our behavior is given a green light to continue. 
we forget that God is still going to judge us. There are all sorts of sayings in our society from this any form of correction. Sayings like lev and lit lev. You do you, I'll do me. You get the idea. We're always trying to avoid judgment. Still, judgment cannot be avoided. This doesn't mean that we should go ahead and judge others. Christ is warning us that how we judge others is how we will be judged. Do we judge with mercy or with scorn? Do we seek forgiveness or do we seek vengeance? I learned a long time ago that I have so much spiritual work to do. Me, Daniel, I don't have time to judge others' behaviors. I have so much. If you want to stop judging others, ask God to help you stay focused and seek a way to fight your temptations. Seek a time out with your father confession. Sometimes we have to hear it a little bit directly from our father confession. Sometimes we have to have that uncomfortable conversation with our father confession who, who kind of gives it to us a little bit. I wonder, I've heard it said, I wonder sometimes if we will even be able to see the door of heaven until we have removed the log from our eye. When it comes to judgment, the log is our ego. And it seems like we can never get away from our ego. St. John Chrysostom teaches us, though. He says to turn our passions against ourselves to defeat the temptation. He says, are you tempted to judge someone? Use the desire to judge, to judge your own actions. So we have this passion, this inclination to judge outwardly to someone else. St. John Chrysostom is saying, use that passion. Good. It's good that you have that passion, but turn it towards yourself. Judge yourself. Eventually, you'll realize you have so much work to work on yourself that you will stop judging others. And then we go back to the reading for today. After Simon kind of said it to himself, if this man, if he were truly a prophet, he would have known. Our Lord loves this stubborn Simon. He loves him as much as he loves the sinful woman. So Christ does what he does so well. Instead of condemning Simon, he tells him a story. He says, two men owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed 500 dinar, right? He tells this passage and he says, which of them will love more? And the, obvious, the, the answer is obvious. And Simon actually got it right. The person who had a greater debt forgiven would show greater amount of love to the person who forgave the debt, right? And so just to kind of put these thoughts together, do we find ourselves comparing ourselves to others? Do we believe that God will look favorably on us because of our ability to keep outward appearances? or because of our outward accomplishments. Today, we apply this sort of thinking to other parts of life. We, we judge people frequently based on what they do or they don't do. And the world tells us that it's okay to judge people even based on opinions that we think they should or should not hold. In all of this, we are losing sight of the one thing needful, which is Christ, our true God. What matters is not what my brother or sister is doing. No, they have to stand in front of God on their own. They don't need my criticism or judgment. They are going to face our maker one day. What matters is that my heart is broken. And I confess my sins because I am hungry and thirsty for God's mercy and his forgiveness. What matters is that 
I understand that I am the chief of sinners who does not in any way deserve God's mercy and his love. What matters is that I am convinced that nothing that I can do on its own can be enough to allow me to stand before God. The Lord has enough Pharisees in this world, but his heart is towards those who are like the repentant woman. Simon, this religious leader, this Pharisee, should have recognized who Christ was and honored him as such, but he doesn't. This woman, this sinner, this one with a bad reputation, this person that you would least expect to recognize Christ and to honor him, she does. The point of the story that Christ illustrates for us was not the amount of sin. The more sin, the more forgiveness, the more love. That's oftentimes misinterpreted. Rather, the point of the story was the awareness of sin. The greater the awareness, the greater the need for forgiveness, and the greater for the gratitude and love for the forgiver. Simon's sins were private, and he wanted to keep them private. This is oftentimes why we avoid seeking out our father confession. We just rather deal with it ourselves. I want to keep it private. I don't want to talk about it. The woman's sins were public. And so she expressed her repentance and her gratefulness in a very public way. As a result, our Lord says to the woman, your sins are forgiven. The church trains us to be able to find the deep and broken heart required to repent and to seek God from a pure heart. I pray that we can cultivate our hearts and ask the Holy Spirit to show us our true broken condition. When we sense our own brokenness and our deep need for our Lord Jesus Christ, and we confess our sins, then and only then are we on the right path. Our prayers will become deep through our pain, and the, path, and the path will lead us directly to Christ, because our prayers will be pure and without any obstacle. I pray that we can take the example of the sinful or the repentant woman and find the deep and broken heart required to repent and to seek God with a pure heart. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Let